Isabella Velicogna. I work at the University of California Irvine and I work on uh, uh, satellite geodesy. I study the mass balance of the ice sheets of using satellite data and the impact of this have on sea level. It's a very neat uh, satellite. So we have uh, two satellites that are orbiting around the Earth. And they're on free fall, means that you know it's like they they're just there. And uh, we know at every we are very accurate the distance between the two satellites. We have a microwave link, and we can know the change in distance better with the better accuracy than micron per second, which is like is a better than you know the size of a blood cell or the size of your hair. And what happened is that when there is more mass. You know, land. You say there is a mountain. The first satellite is attractive because you know there's a gravitational pull, and so it goes faster, and the distance between the two becomes smaller and become bigger. And then uh, once the second one gets closer, it gets attractive, accelerated, and the distance becomes shorter. And so measuring those changes, you know, we have basically every 30 days we have a map of the entire globe. What we can see, we can see what changed from one month to the other, and the mountain is there one month in the other. What changes, if you think, is that, uh, you know, water in a river basin, mass in the ocean, and the ice uh, on the ice sheets and on the mountain glacier. And, uh, you know, we, there are some techniques that do much better job at looking at the smaller scale. So we have like a big footprint. We got an average of an area that is a few hundred kilometer radius, so it's a big area. But, but it's nice because every month, you know, now I have data through October. So I can see what happened, you know, I can somehow, you can imagine you can just weight the grill and ice sheets and you can see, you, know, you don't know what is the absolute weight, you, know, you don't know what is, you know, I weight, I don't know, 160 pounds, you know, I don't know how much it is, but we can say, oh, look, it's getting, you know, heavier in, in, in winter and less in summer. So you can see all those changes. And, it, you know, it's pretty amazing from up there. I mean, they started like a few hundred kilometers up, you know, in altitude and and they've been doing a great job. And I think the, you know, the cryosphere and study the ice sheet is really one of the, uh, the important application of this data set. And there are many other, they're like in looking at water storage, you know, for the first time we can monitor groundwater depletion, which is something that, especially in remote region, you know, is not easy. But for the ice sheet has been, you know, the f when we just, uh, we're able to say, oh, we look at the entire Antarctic ice sheet and we look at the mass change and look, it's changing and it's going down, it's decreasing. You know, there were a lot of other techniques. They were seeing some region change and they knew that a lot of parts of Antarctica were changing. But then maybe someone could say, oh, well, but you don't have a shot at the same time of everything. So that's why it's great, I think, for, for the data set that we have. You know, we have, we have a point in which we have a very good set of data set, you know, and the satellite, especially for study the ice sheets are really helpful because, you know, Antarctica is so remote and it's so big that if you have to go and measure it up and down, it's, it's hard. And, uh, and now we have different measurements, they are very complementary and they all are more sensitive to different processes so we can get a good picture. What I was referring now was talking about measurement of mass balance. So measuring the change, the look at the change in mass. And there are mainly, you know, uh, three uh, satellite, you know, technique that you can use. So one is grace, gravitational. So you just literally measure the change in mass of, uh, you know, the ice. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and if you want, is a direct measurement. And then it has to be corrected by, you know, underneath the ice sheet, the crust uplift, subside as a response to the last deglaciation. And so we have to remove that effect. But once we have that, you know, we just can it's basically directly measuring the change in mass. Then there is a, a, the mass budget method. I use a, a combination of uh, uh, interferometry data to look at how the ice flow. And then we have information. If we know what is the section you know, of the glacier, then we can say how much is the ice flows out. So we know how much is discharged. And then we can get the input and this we get it from some uh, regional climate model. Those days, these are the ones that provide the best, you know, we have the, they, they are doing a great job. And so we, you combine the two pieces and you have the total mass, chain, mass balance of the ice sheets. And then there is altimetry, which doesn't really directly measure the change in mass, it measures changes in elevation. 
And so it's very accurate to tell you how the surface of the ice sheets, but then if we want to convert this in mass, you have to assume, you know, okay, is the mass change, this elevation change, and what density occurred? Was there ice or what there's no? And so, you know, in some region, you know, it's, it's tricky because, you know, there's a big difference. It's like you can have almost a factor two, you know, like density of ice goes between, you know, it's like 0.9 and then you can have until maybe, you know, uh, if it's less uh, dense ice, you know, but density of snow is between 0.3 and 0.6. So if you multiply by one and the other, you can have a different change in mass. But on the other hand, you get a very accurate information about the elevation. So. So those are the three techniques that now we have. The ice sheets are losing mass at a very significant rate. Greenland uh, is uh, losing mass faster. You know, uh, if you look over the last 10 years, uh, well, I'm just telling the estimate from Grace because I have it off the top of my head, but you know, uh, from 2002 to 2000 to now, you know, you can you have a mass loss is about 270 gigaton per year, which is uh, the equivalent of about a little bit less than 0.8 millimeter of sea level equivalent. And uh, and but the the thing so this is like if you measure an average loss, and uh, and is and then uh, you know if you look, but the, pro the fact is that the mass is not doesn't change every year the same way. It's increasing with time. And we see a big acceleration in the mass loss. It means that every year is melting more. And, uh, and so, and all the other techniques agree that, you know, Greenland is significantly contributing to sea level. With GRACE, we have 12 years of data, then if you can extend the record with other techniques, both ultimately, particularly the mass budget, we can have longer time series. So we could get measured from the 60s, estimate from the 1960s. And so then you get, you know, 10 years for the story of the ice sheets. You know, it's like when you talk about climate, climate usually is an average over 30 years. So 10 years, and especially because how are we seeing like, you know, is this representative of the long-term variability? But now we have, uh, we can combine, you know, all the measurements, which so uh, the fact that they, they are in good agreement also, you know, somehow tell us that, oh, we are looking, you know, give us more confidence in all of them. So then we can look at those extended time series and it shows that since the 60s, the ice sheets, you know, Greenland is, looks like it's losing mass and, you know, the mass loss is maybe changing. We can also see from this that we cannot look at the short period. We really have to look at the longer record to have a clear picture. For Antarctica, we're seeing the, the, the mass loss is increasing and uh, we are seeing that for sure, like West Antarctica, the mass loss is, is, is accelerating, is increasing with time, especially, you know, there's some in the Allenson Sea sector. And that, you know, we just had actually a paper that, in which we look at this region, combining all the different techniques and uh, looking at how the mass is changing uh, with respect, you know, to the, the 20 the, uh, the la 20 year period. And we found that you know, in the last 10 years, the mass loss increases three times faster than over the average of the last 20 years. And, uh, you know, so things are happening fast, you know, and, and I think that, you know, it's, a, it's exciting for us to study, but I think that, you know, we should just be, it's a big signal, you know, between the Antarctic and Greenland, you can, you get uh, uh, more than, uh, it's like I'm just doing the top of my head, but, you know, a millimeter of sea level rise, just, you know, as, a year. Mm. There are like a lot of studies that shows, you know, especially both, you know, in, well, in, uh, in uh, the Arctic. I mean, there's a clear agreement that, you know, the Arctic is warming <laughs> and things are changing very fast. The ocean is warming and there is like, and, and in the Arctic for Greenland, the mass change is a good portion, you know, between 50 and 60 percent is driven by surface mass balance, which is very sensitive to, you know, uh, climate, you know, precipitation and runoff. And uh, so uh, the, all the studies just show that, you know, there is, you know, the connection because of this warming, that things look like they're happening faster. In Antarctica, um, there are studies that have been showing that there is, uh, you know, it's like there are very dramatic changes that are observed. There is an increase in temperature. They have been observing increase, you know, change in warming in the ocean and a change in the ocean wind. And there are some studies that relate the fact of, you know, those changes in ocean wind are related and all those other changes to the warming. And the change in wind, uh, there are some studies that show that, you know, bring more water closer to the glacier. And once, you know, the, the warm water come, 
the ice, there is a, the ice sheet, more the ice shelf, which is like basically the slab of ice, the, just it's still attached at the ice, but it's floating, is very sensitive to change in temperature of the ocean. Because those ice shelves, you see a little slab on top, but they're very, very deep down in the ocean. Basically, see only 10% out, so they can be like, you know, hundreds of meters. And what happens at depth is that the melting point of ice is lower. It means that you take, as you need a smaller change in temperature because the pressure is higher to melt ice at depth. And so, if even a smaller change in temperature at depth can have a big effect, melting portion of the ice shelf. And once the ice shelf, uh, you know, if those ice shelves melt and the weakness has been shown, as in the case, for example, of Larsen B. The, you know, you basically, uh, the ice shell works a little bit like a, a, it's like if you have a cork in a bottle of champagne, you know, it's like stopping the champagne, you break the ice shelf and the champagne comes out. And so the glacier has been observed to once the ice shelf, you know, um, collapse and it breaks up in pieces, they have been observed flowing faster in the ocean. So these are all things that, you know, so, and, and, there, and there is a lot of, you know, new research, especially in the last few years, in trying to understand the interaction between ocean and, uh, and ice sheet and ice, uh, and ice, ice dynamic, and ice sheets. Because, you know, we are trying to put together all the pieces that we are serving in changing. All the water that is used, like in LA County, for example, for doing everything, industry, you know, agriculture, water in one year, you know, and this LA County so is big, you know, like, and there are people, they water a lot, they mm. are, I'm joking. <laughs> but it's about, it's a little bit more than a gigaton a year. So this, this is like every year, it's like 200, more than 270 times that. So it's a lot of water. The GRACE is a NASA, a German a DLR, German Space Agency mission, and actually the GRACE follow one also is going to be a combination, you know, sponsored by both these agencies. But uh, he, there are scientists everywhere in the world. I think it's a great tool. You know, data are posted, you know, a few months after on the web, so everyone, you know, can download them and look in theory. You can just sit down and download and see what's happening with Greenland. Now you have to do, you know, you can have a first look and actually, you know, really, you know, just get the data and have a you know, a preliminary idea. Then, of course, you know, to get the number right and everything, you have to just do more processing. But I think that uh, more and more scientists are using it. I think that, you know, uh, there are different communities that are appreciating the importance, you know. Uh, I think the, the cryosphere, it was pretty obvious, you know, that was, it was an important piece of information, uh, despite, you know, the big footprint. Uh, in hydrology also, I think uh, they, they're like more and more student because it's one of the, you know, if it's basically, it's the only way that we have to close the water cycle. So it's very important in monitoring drought. And uh, despite the fact that, you know, model is not necessarily so obvious how to uh, assimilate this data, you know, in models because the model is very core scale and it's very complicated to just, but still you have a data set that, you know, otherwise the only other option is like going and put wells everywhere. <laughs> Which, you know, you can maybe do it in the U.S., but there are some other places where it's hard, you know, like in India. And so it's been very, very useful in monitoring, you know, drought. And also uh, has been used uh, in uh, looking at how vegetation changes occur related to changing water storage. So it has a lot of application. And there are people, you know, all over, I think, all over the world, you know, like uh, I think people in India, for example, we get a lot of, you know, they are really interested because they care about groundwater. Groundwater is really a very important, you know, resource there and it's very vital, you know, the, the fact that the is changing their depletion depletion too much makes a big difference for the population, for the agriculture. So they are more and more interested in trying to use whatever is there. So it was launched in two thousand two and it's still a uh, collecting measurement. It was a three to five year mission. So now we have 12 years of data and it's doing well. But, you know, of course, there is not any redundant part. But in principle, so far as energy and consumption, so everything goes well, we should be able to get uh, to 2017 where there should be the launch on a GRACE follow-on okay. in August 2017. 
But then again, now what they are starting to do, they are now measure, taking measure every month. So maybe they skip some months, so they save energy and that we can just extend the lifetime because it's important to have overlap for continuity. Mm. But it's doing, it's still great. We're also working and thinking a way to eventually, if that happens, how you can just establish continuity, so how to can just breach, you know, the two, because grace doesn't measure the total mass, may measure changes in mass. And so it's relative to, you know, a mean is an anomaly. So if you have a gap, you have to figure out yeah. how yeah. to, you know, you don't want to have, a, you know, you have to shift the right way. I try to do, you know, what I can. I appreciate it when, you know, people ask me to do it because sometimes, you know, you have so much to do that you don't make it as your first priority, but if there is an occasion, it's a good thing. And I think that it's very important to make people aware I, I, uh, of how things are and what is happening because I do think that a lot of the misconception that, you know, outside they have is because Science is moving very fast in this. You know, we have so many more data set. We have longer time series. We have more reliable record. And I think that sometimes the scientists know, but then, you know, the scientists are busy and don't necessarily, you know, they, it's not that, where do I go to tell people? You know, you write your, your article, but your article is in a technical journal. So my grandmother doesn't hear that or whatever. So I think that a big part of a lot of the misconceptions is because, you know, the, the flux of information, you know, and it's normal, but things are really changing, you know, very, very fast in a few years. If you think the IP, two IPCC ago, I think it was like before 2006, the IPCC was saying that we expect Antarctica to grow in a warming climate because of the increase in precipitation. And the IPCC, the last IPCC says, well, we're seeing the Antarctica is, you know, the West Antarctica is losing mass, and there are like two techniques that show that overall, you know, the ice sheets is just losing mass. So it's a big change, and it's not because the scientists didn't know what, what was going on before. It's because we have more data set, we have longer time series, and so we can make better analysis. That's not easy. You know, there are like, a, I, I do different things. I think there are a lot of different good scientific questions. I think they, uh, it's very interesting and try to understand wh what is the, how the ice ocean interaction, you know, affect the, the ice sheet. I think that there is a, a big question, which is now, I, I do some work related to looking at in, in the high Arctic, now the uh, water cycle, the, the vegetation is changing as a consequence, you know, with, with the warming and how water and temperature control affect changes in vegetation. And I think that that's a very complicated question and it's a good question, you know, how the ecosystem is going to respond, you know, to the warming and how, you know, how, because things are happening in a different way respect to what we were expecting. We were expecting they always warming, the Arctic is going to be all warm, longer growing season, and the plants are going to go crazy, uh, you know, photosynthesis go go and it's going to act as a carbon sink. And uh, in the last few years, they start to observe that there are some places where they're actually, you know, the, the plants are suffering, there's a decrease in productivity. And so, you know, things are occurring differently than what we expected. And, that, you know, so there are like a lot of good questions. I think that, you know, the understanding, you know, how the ice sheets evolve and how the ice ocean interaction affect that and how try to understand what are the processes. We still have a lot of to do in understanding, you know, how uh, the different the, the ma mass loss, you know, how, the, the ma how to be able to model, fully model, the, you know, the, the time variability and how the, the I should respond to climate vari variability. I actually, so I always like science. I, it's, it's, it's kind of a funny story, but I just, uh, I wanted to do physics when I was in high school. I did physics and then I wanted to do research, so I started to do geophysics. And then uh, I was, uh, during my PhD, I was in the US for, I was doing something very different. I was doing tech, uh, tectonics more and actually flexurized geodynamics. And I was looking for a postdoc and I went around and I ended up uh, having an offer to work on GRACE, which was no lunch. It was like in 1999, so it was three years before it was lunch. And I started working on, uh, on this mission, and then I started working more and more on the cryosphere. And I just think, you know, life sometimes happened this way, but it's much better than what I was doing before. <laughs>
So I'm very lucky. Do you ever do any site research? Do you go, out, go out on site? Yeah, so well, uh, lately, uh, I started the last, well, lately, in the last, you know, a few years, few years, maybe a decade, or, you know, I was like to go in the field sometime. I went in, uh, in Greenland on a boat to take measurement in the fjords of the temperature and uh, salinity profile within the fjord and, you know, the bathymetry. And uh, I mean, it's great. I think he and I went also, I flew on top of Antarctica in some missions, some survey. And I think it makes a big difference. I think if one study the glacier, it's good to go see them, to see what happened. You know, you go, you go after a couple of years and it's a different glacier if you are on the front, you know, for some glacier in Greenland. I, th I go and I, and I love it. Like the field work is very nice because it's just very, you know, you have to pay attention, but it's a different work that if you are the computer and you have to code and you have to write equation and you have a, it's a different experience and then you realize, you know, what is going on, you know, like how are the conditions, you know, the ice sheet. So I think it get, gets you a better understanding of what you're doing when you use the other data set. You do all your modeling, all the other things. But it was, you know, it's great to get to, I think there is a special thing about people that do field work and work in the cryosphere because you get together also with your colleague in a different way. Because, you know, you wake up sometime at 3 a.m. to do measurement, you know, you have like 24 hour measure, so you have turn and, uh, and you know, you end up doing measurement. Maybe you put up, you know, music and you're all dancing when you're doing the measurement. So there's like a part of all of this, you know, or maybe you're all soaked and wet and you just, uh, you know, you're there and it's still fun. And you cut from your cut, you're off, you know, there we didn't have email, we didn't have anything. So it's good. You just focus on seeing how things happen. I, I think it's very, it's very good also because you really see the changes. You see that things change a lot. A store is a glacier in Greenland. And uh, uh, last time I was there, it was uh, more than, I think it was about five years ago. And I asked somebody and I saw it and I was like, oh, wow. It's like a different glacier because it retreated so much. They, it's like, uh, you know, it's like you see someone with, uh, I don't know, blonde with blue, with blue eyes and then you meet him again. He's like a dark hair and dark eyes. And it's like, oh, it's like, it's, was the, this, this is a little bit excessive, but it was really, is this the same glacier? And I went to look at my picture that I took five years ago and it's really changed, you know, the ice retreated, it, it's very different. I think the sea in the ice sheet, once you see it, you know, Antarctica, uh, I flow on Antarctica, you know, it was like, a, I never was on land there. I think it gives you more perspective. I think, you know, you just try to, also when you think about the processes, you see, you know, the ice sheet, you see the ice, you see the mountain range, you see, you know, the glacier, you see how, you know, the glacier, you know, the topography of the glacier, I think it makes you think, you know, it's not uh, the data more, you know, connected more, what are the processes, what is out there. So I think it's very useful. There is one graph that I think is the one that really anybody that look at that, it cannot. It's like this, uh, and it's this plot of the uh, change in temperature and CO2 concentration. And, it, you know, we have uh, ice is a great thing, not because, you know, it's like it's a fun media, but from ice core, we can get information, you know, uh, uh, about past climate. And the one thing that is really preserved in the bubble of ice, and you know, uh, Antarctica is very thick. So we can go back many, many, you know, under thousand years. And if we, we can get information about what is the concentration of CO2 and the main greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, because those gases have this very nice property that they are very uniformly distributed, you know, mixed in the troposphere, which is the layer, you know, closer to the surface. And you can see that, you know, if you look at temperature, you know, the plot of changes in temperature and changes in CO2 concentration, they go together. When temperature is high, CO2 concentration is high. And when it's low, CO2 concentration is low. And, you know, they go up and down. And after the industrial era, you can see that, you know, the temperature, sure, goes up and down, but the concentration of CO2, especially just skyrocket and all this other. And, uh, the only thing that changed is us. And we're not saying, oh, temperature has been higher, you know, in the last, uh, you know, a little bit less than a million years, you know, like in 900,000 years, uh, you know, on our planet. But CO2 concentration has never been as high. And also it's changing in the last, and I think that that, you know, that's data. And I think that that, you know, doesn't, doesn't 
doesn't leave any doubt that, you know, there is an anthropogenic effect. But, you know, that's okay. You know, we do things. I think that, so I don't think that, that, that that's the question anymore. I think that anyone that saw that plot cannot have doubt.